Welcome back to How to Be a Better DM, the official podcast of Monsters.Rent. I'm Justin Lewis. And I'm Tanner Wayland. And we are here to help you tell better stories for yourself and your players as you dungeon master sessions of D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. We'd like to give you some quick announcements. We actually have one before the show. And then after the show, if you want to stick around, we have some more announcements then as well. Uh, but first, let's talk about this. Tired of being alone? Are you tired of not having any of your players understand you? Are you tired of never truly belonging? Well, you're in luck. All you need to do is join the Guild. The Guild is a unique and exclusive experience that is only open to Dungeon Masters. It is a full community focused on helping ease your DMing burdens. Want to meet other DMs? Join the Guild. Want to discuss your homebrew ideas with people who would appreciate it instead of just telling your cat? Join the guild! Want to find a place where all your wildest dreams will come true? Join the guild! Go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free. Wait, that can't be right. Chuck, Chuck, can you check this again? Is this supposed to be... What? Oh, it's... They're serious? It's free? Oh. Okay, all right. Yes, go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free, even though they are crazy for giving this away for free. Common side effects may include burping, sneezing, laughing, breathing, hearing, listening, tasting, farting, critting, sarcasm, and in extreme cases, explosive diarrhea. Awesome. With that out of the way, we can get into today's show. Welcome back to today's show. I am Justin Lewis here with Tanner Wayland, and we have with us special guest, Robison Wells. Uh, Rob is a friend of mine from work, and he's also a New York Times publisher. So, or not publisher, author. Sorry, uh, but I'll I'll let Rob give himself a little introduction. Today, we're going to be talking about character writing and development. Uh, so, without any further ado, Rob, go ahead and tell the listener about yourself and and, and what you do. Yeah, my name is Robison Wells. Um, I go by Rob, but Robison is on the cover of all my books. Um, I have written 15 novels that have been published, at least. Um, my most recent book uh, hit the New York Times bestseller list. Um, that came out in 2019, um, but my first book came out in 2003, so I've been at this for a while, and uh, uh, written a lot of stuff. Uh, I started out, my first book was actually a romantic comedy, um, and then I went into uh, suspense, and... Then I hit the big time uh, writing the dystopian young adult genre in about 2009, right when Hunger Games came out. And that's when I really started to take off. And then I wrote that uh, for the next 10 years. And, uh, and I'm kind of taking a break right now from, from publishing, um, but uh, working on other projects... Uh, I am currently spending most of my time blogging, but uh, awesome. yeah. that's great. Uh, what are you writing in your blog uh, typically? My blog is about miniature wargaming. Oh, actually. perfect! Yeah, I've been a miniature wargamer since I was nine years old, and uh, and I spend all of my time now focused on um, at work, uh, just like Justin. Uh, it's a, a digital marketing mm -hmm. company, uh, an agency, and I am a content writer for them. And I realized about two years ago, it was May of 2021, I realized that um, uh, I was spending all of my time doing all this SEO work and all of this blog writing for other people's blogs. Why didn't I try to put those efforts into my own blog and try to make some money doing that and so that's what i do and now it is uh it's i mean now it's doing phenomenally well and uh well phenomenally <laughs> well in in my uh estimation um it still has a long way to go but uh it's making me money there which i can't complain about and uh and it's fun Excellent. i really enjoy it that's awesome uh go ahead and and drop uh, or, or just tell the listener the, the URL for that. Um, listener, if you haven't checked out uh, Wargame Minis, you should check out Rob's because they are painted and crafted extremely well. 
Uh, every time he posts a picture, I am blown away. So, Rob, what's what's the URL for that? Yeah, it's wargameexplorer.com. Awesome. We'll have that in the uh, yeah. show notes. But let's let's get into character development. So the first question I have is, where do you start when creating characters for your books or, or, or whatever you're writing? Sure. So with my books, um, I always start, and everyone is different how they write them, but I start primarily with story. Um, and because of that, when I'm writing my characters, I generally have a conflict that I want to highlight with the character. So, um, so I look at the situation because I'm very much a plot driven writer. So I look at the plot that I have and then I figure out who would conflict most with this plot. So, for example, my, my book that is best known is called Variant, and it is about uh, a, it is a young adult science fiction um, book about this kid who gets sent to a boarding school in the middle of nowhere where uh, they're basically prisoners and can't leave, and, um, and so I thought, who would be in the most conflict with these with this situation and I said well he would if he's being confined in, in a prison like school he would most likely be a nonconformist um, he would be someone who is uh, a rugged individualist um, he would be uh, independent and and then as I work on the plot and other things come to mind so so the school is kind of run by gangs and that individualism that I've put in him really strikes up in this where he, he rebels against both the school, he rebels against the gangs. And because I find the most fun of writing characters comes from that conflict that they have with the setting. Hmm. So you essentially t- you create a situation that would be interesting given the right character was inserted and then you kind of create the character that would make that situation interesting yeah very much so i i create i i have an idea of where i want the plot to go and then i think what would make this plot more interesting and the interest always comes from conflict so i i i always try to come up with a character who's going to be conflicted so uh, another example my very first book um, was about a is a romantic comedy. It is kind of a fish out of water story. Um, a guy who moves to a small town in New Mexico, which is a place that I used to live, and um, and so I wanted him to be. I mean, this is a very. This is going to be very stereotypical because it was my first book, and it is it very much follows tropes, but. A fish out of water is is kind of the archetype of what I'm yeah. talking about, where the story is small town, quirky characters, um, weird little uh, storylines going on about small towns. So you bring in someone who is sophisticated, educated, big city, money, and introduce them into this small town and then they're at conflict with everything. So, I mean, that is... I mean, everyone has seen a movie like that, uh, a fish-out-of-water story. Um, but that's that's really gotcha. what I'm getting at. Yeah, that, that's, that's a huge idea, because if you think about it, uh, a lot of stories, it's just like, hey, well, what can we make the protagonist that clashes with either the setting or the story? Like, I don't know why I thought about this, but I was like, even Cinderella, like a story like that, it's like, oh, what's the conflict? The stepmother and stepsisters, and she's not. That's like the only difference, and yet it co- it drives the whole conflict, you know. Um, and it's just interesting how like the change doesn't the difference that makes someone an odd man out doesn't need to be huge, but it can still drive a lot of uh, the plot, you know. 
Yeah. The other thing I would add is this is a very interesting idea, especially because in, in Dungeons and Dragons and being a dungeon master, you you almost need to craft the situation around your players, but then you have all these NPCs that you do need to kind of create situations and fit the perfect NPC into. Um, were there any examples in your writing where you did have a situation, or oh, sorry, not a situation, but y- you know, your character was moving forward and you kind of had to craft the story around them or, or, or some of their actions and things like that? I mean, sure. There's absolutely situations like that where, um, where the character is moving forward. Like, for example, my, uh, my next big series after that first series variant was a series called Blackout, and it is a story, it's also a young adult, kind of post-apocalyptic, um, uh, where teenagers are getting super superpowers. And um, as the character is developing his superpowers, his main, his, his main um, uh, power is that he has heightened senses. He can see really well, he can hear really well, uh, he can smell really well. It comes with side effects where, like, he gets nauseated really easily because everything smells so bad to him. And um, but and he gets headaches because he can see and hear so much. But um, uh, as he gets better and better with his powers, and he is using them, he's being used by the military, kind of against his will. As he is learning better how to use these powers I really you have to step up the conflict in the plot so that and this is absolutely the same thing that you come into in Dungeons and Dragons um, you never want your characters to be comfortable to the point of it being easy for them like you want them to progress but as they progress the challenges that they meet get harder and harder I mean, the example that I was thinking of when you were talking about Cinderella, um, I was thinking of Luke yeah. Skywalker. I mean, he is... Uh, it is a story about science fiction wizards, and he is a farm boy. And he starts to learn the Force and gets better and better, but as he gets better and better, the stakes get higher and higher, and the challenges get worse and worse until he's eventually fighting against the emperor when he started in the very beginning when he first gets the lightsaber from ben there's no way he could be fighting against the emperor um that's something that would takes him three movies to get to um so yeah so and very much the same thing in dungeons and dragons where your characters you want them to always have bad guys that they are just at the the they're barely able to beat yes. them. You never want it to seem easy, but you want it to seem accomplishable. Yeah, just like that. Uh, that uh, is, that bad guy is just on the next you know limb uh, from where they are, and if they just reach a little bit more, grow a little bit more, then they can do it. Uh, it which is a great point because I think that some uh, DMs really uh, cut their the motivation in their story in half by immediately showing the big bad. And then not really having any stepping stones to that big bad, you know? They're just like, oh, you'll get there eventually. And then it's kind of like, hey, just get stronger and eventually get there. Uh, Versus being like kind of almost revealing little by little and hinting at a big bad until eventually they're like, hey, they're strong enough to actually face that. But he's still, you know, it's still a little out of reach. Yeah, I actually have an example of that in my current campaign with my players. So if you're a player of mine, stop listening. Um, spoiler alert. But <clears throat> one of my characters found a uh, uh, like a sentient weapon, right? Which turned out to be uh, one in a number of weapons that were all kind of part of this one entity. And the entity wanted to rejoin itself. Naturally, the weapon was cursed. The person didn't know that. Uh, or they did, but... They got mad. It's my. It was my wife, so it was really fun to kind of tease her like this. But she she eventually combined it enough that it became powerful enough to kind of sustain itself. It actually stole that character from her, which she's still mad at me about. Um, but I've been slowly hinting at the fact that like that is the big bad at the very end. 
like whenever she tries and reaches out to that entity, you know, it, it's like very nefarious. Uh, I've been actually adding in like another cult that they see around town that's just like preaching under a different name, but it's connected. Um, so, so I guess my point is compared to what I've done, right? I, I've kind of planned it out from the end. Like I know that at the end they're going to fight the, the, this character's name is Dreamtaker. They're going to fight Dreamtaker. In order to step up the conflict, do you have to know the end every single time, in your opinion? I don't think you do. I am... Well, it depends. In writing, it's referred to as pantsers and plotters, which is basically you're either a plotter, which is you outline everything and you know where you're going, or they refer to them as pantsers, uh, meaning you <laughs> go by the seat of your pants. Um, and... Um, and I have always been somewhere in between. I definitely love the outline, but I do like the freedom to make it up as I go. Um, so, it, but I don't think that there is a solid rule to this because I know so many people who, I know mystery writers who are phenomenal mystery writers. Um, there's a, a great writer named Heather Moore. Um, who she makes a very good living as a writer, puts out probably two books a year. Um, she writes mysteries, and when she starts writing the book, and even a third of the way into the book, she doesn't know who committed the crime. <laughs> she, she basically creates a situation where she sets up all the people who could have done it, and then as the story progresses she's she figures out which one she wants to have done it and and then of course you go back and you revise which is not a not an option that you have in dungeons and dragons <laughs> you don't get to go back and revise because once you do something in dungeons and dragons it's set in stone i mean you've already done it but in writing you can definitely uh figure something out and then go back and add the foreshadowing and uh, drop all the clues um, and add all of that. So so it's easier in writing. It's, it's kind of a luxury that writers, the novelists have that uh, DMs don't have. Yeah, but, but I like the idea, actually, because I was thinking, I was like, what if I was planning a session and, like, the characters were going through a cave and at the end I wanted something and my current idea is only so-so. I was like, what if I just came up with something cool? You know, it's like, oh, there's a dead body uh, with an icicle th uh, through it. And then within it, there's like some crazy thing. And I don't need to know what <laughs> caused that, you know? Like, if I wanted to spice it up, I could be like, hey, at the end, they'll find this really cool thing in my mind. And then if they do some searches, here's some facts that I can give them. But I don't know what caused this. And that's okay. I'll figure it out later. You know, uh, it, it's yeah. kind of an interesting idea that I think, I don't know, as DMs, I think we want so much knowledge and control in the world because uh, we're like, hey, we're the person with the big picture, right? Uh, I mean, sometimes maybe you don't need to have the whole picture, right? Yeah. 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 When I wrote my first book, that one that was the, the fish out of water story, there's a... Um, it's not really a mystery to it, but there is a uh, a dramatic moment that f there's a flashback. So the story starts with a guy waking up in the middle of the desert all by himself, having been hit on the head, and um, he's, he's stuck in the desert. And when I wrote that, and it's just like a page long, and then it... it flashes back and tells the story of how we got to where we were when i wrote that i didn't know why he was in the desert i didn't know who had hit him on the head um i didn't know any of the answers to this but what what had happened is that i had been trying to write this book for so long and i'd been just kept on getting stuck and i decided well i'm just gonna free write i'm going to um uh, write without constraint, without worry, without anything, and and that was what came up. And suddenly, having written that, uh, everything 
else made sense where I'm like, well, if he did get in, if he was in the desert, then this is how he could have gotten there. That makes a little bit more sense. If he was on the hit on the head, maybe this character could have done it. And and so it was the freedom to kind of play in the world, to experiment, and then everything fell into place. Which is not to say that every time that you free write, you're going to keep it. But it's definitely a way to break through and brainstorm and um, and uh, and break through uh, roadblocks and and uh, what's the mm -hmm. writer's block? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what you said there is is so true, uh, and I would even combine it with what you said previously about kind of having to 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 walk that line between pantsing and plotting. Uh, I find in my own session prep. Uh, if I write things out too specific, I, I find myself stifled. I find that whatever scene I'm creating has just suddenly become boring because I've planned everything out. But on the other hand, you know, and that naturally gives me anxiety, but on the other hand, if I don't plan anything, I, I, I give myself anxiety as well. And I also find that while I'm doing session prep, if I do start kind of going to that, like, this scene is boring, I'll literally go to something else and, and free write and kind of just kind of not vomit of the brain, right? But but just let myself put it on paper and that opens up my mind. So, so both those things are incredibly important, especially for DMs because we do have to kind of like be right in between lawful and chaotic uh, with how we plan our stories because our characters, they get it to choose, right? We can have this plan and then randomly, they just decide not to care about it. So, so I, I find that's, that's very insightful as well. And it also is heartening because, you know, you don't have to know exactly everything just to play. Like, you don't have to know the answer, especially because your characters, your players, are probably going to give you some really good ideas. So if you're paying attention and you hear they're like, oh, what about this? You can write it down and make that what happens, right? So yeah. uh, I, I, one other question I wanted to ask. So we've talked a lot about conflict. And... Honestly, on this podcast, this is something Tanner and I haven't completely dived into, actually. And I like the fact that you are, or at least the way I'm perceiving it, you're defining characters as almost like the other side of conflict. Like, characters define conflict, but conflict also defines characters, right? So, so talk to us a little bit about conflict, and what are some types of conflict that a, a writer or a dungeon master might use? And what are some that are your favorite? Sure. Well, I think that the best conflict is always going to be character conflict. Um, uh, and that is where you have a conflict that is um, a character. I mean, in, in writing, they teach you the four main conflicts, which I'm going to forget about, which is man versus nature man versus uh man man versus self and man versus uh society I maybe the last one is but yeah. could be society yeah um but the one that i've always found to be the most interesting is man versus self um where it is you can you can tell any story and have any of those conflicts. Man versus nature is obviously something like, like uh, you're in a hurricane. You're, it's it's Twister. It's it's uh, a volcano story. Um, uh, man versus uh, man is a a battle story or a conflict story. But but think of think of any of those stories. All of the best conflict is going to be man versus self. It's going to be um, like Lord of the Rings. There's a part in Lord of the Rings, and I don't cry during movies, I never cry during movies, but there is one uh, part of Lord of the Rings that I cannot watch without crying, and it is when they're climbing up Mount Doom, and Sam says, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you, and picks up Frodo, and the music mm -hmm. swells, and he starts carrying him up. Um, what you have right there, you've definitely got 
uh, man versus yep. nature because there the, it, you have the conflict of everything is hot and dry and hard to climb. You've got man versus man, which is they're going against Gollum and the orcs. But the big conflict that you've got right there, you've got two man versus selfs right there. You don't have Sam versus Frodo, but you've got Frodo versus Frodo's darker Mm -hmm. side. And then you have Sam who triumphs over... um, he doesn't give in to the darker side like Frodo does. He triumphs over the bad nature that we have within us. He triumphs over those those bad drives that we have within ourselves to give up, to to um, to abandon your friends, to go home, and he he sacrifices everything for his friend and it that is that is that battle of man versus self um frodo obviously has the battle of man versus self it's it's those man versus self that really in my mind make everything more interesting that's a hard thing to do in dungeons and dragons because that is something that the characters have to kind of bring on mm-hmm. their own a dungeon master can't force man versus self onto a character, but they can place them in situations where um, they have to fight against their own inner nature and develop as people rather than just develop as a better fighter or develop as a survivalist. And yeah. actually, so <clears throat> you you touched on that exact point that I wanted to bring up. As a dungeon master, you only have Unfortunately, when it comes to your characters, or at least the player characters, you only have like 50% control. Uh, how, even as a writer though, how do you make the situation subtle enough that it's fulfilling? That, it, that you know, that you kind of have to work to understand, oh my gosh, you know, Sam is also fighting against Sam. Uh, but obvious enough that your players or the reader can also understand that, right? Like, that it's not hidden. Like, how do you walk that line of subtle versus clear? It's hard to do, uh, but there is a, uh, a phrase, and I can't remember who, who even coined the phrase, but, um, but I've always liked it. Um, you want your climax to be surprising but inevitable. Um, so that um, the end of your story... You want it to surprise your reader, but you also want the reader to say, well, there's no other way this could have happened. Like, this is this is perfect. This is exactly what needed to happen. And so going back to Lord of the Rings, um, now I, I've read the Lord of the Rings since my dad read them to me when I was 11 years old. Um, but... I would bet that for most people, and for me when I was 11, um, when Frodo is at the end and he doesn't want to throw the ring into the, the volcano, and then all of a sudden Gollum comes, Gollum bites off his finger, and Gollum falls into the volcano, that is a surprising thing, but you're like, it's yeah. perfect. It couldn't have happened in a better way. And... Um, and that is what the surprising yet inevitable thing is. And I honestly am not a good enough dungeon master to know how to make that happen with your characters. Because in books, uh, I have, again, the luxury of being able to go back and revise and to put the foreshadowing in earlier um, and, and to lay the foundation for that surprising yet inevitable thing. But I think that's what you're. That's that's what you're going for. That's that's the desired outcome. Is this surprising yet inevitable? Yeah, I, I love that. Especially, uh, it, it got me thinking when you were like, "I'm not sure how to do that as a DM." I was thinking about it, and I was like, "You know what? I think so much of having a good payoff at the end. You know, as a dungeon master, 
comes with paying attention to your player's uh, choices. You know, if you're paying attention to like, hey, maybe the player is just being the average, you know, murder hobo or whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, in their adventure. But on the other hand, if you're paying attention to the choices they make, and then at the end point, if you present them with that choice, like, hey, do the 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 greater good option um, or go for the thing you've always gone for, like the big treasure, uh, then that could make such an interesting story where the care, where the player has to essentially narrate, Hey, why does the player, why does this character choose the greater good over this really good treasure that they could totally get away with, you know? Um, But I think you can't have that unless along the journey, and at the end, the DM is presenting options, like actually like good options that allow the uh, the character to kind of come out, yeah. you know. Uh, and then you can have that moment where you're like, oh, this is surprising but inevitable because you knew the character um, by giving those choices early on. I would actually take it a step further and, and using the analogy of Lord of the Rings. Um, obviously, we know it's a book, but if it were real those instances where along the way up to Mount Doom, Frodo was tested, Gollum tested Frodo or Sam. In, in, if that was reality, those wouldn't have been, you know, the author going back and saying, like inserting those, right? Those would have been just moments where it wasn't thinking, you know, n- none of the characters were thinking, I'm doing this to lead up to a final thing. They're thinking, I want to see if I can do this right now like they're just caring about so i think what i mean by that is along with what tanner said along the way to kind of that big emotional payoff you kind of you provide tests you know not just choices but like specific tests you know to try and get them to deviate from how they're acting or something like that in hopes that maybe that would lead them on a path to a different payoff and and you know um we can even think of like star wars Along the way, there were moments where Anakin Skywalker had temptations, I guess you could say, to do something non-Jedi-like. So when he eventually bowed to Lord Sidious and said, I I will do whatever you ask, just save Padme, it wasn't a surprise for us because we'd seen him kill Count Dooku. We'd seen him, you know, get angry at Obi-Wan for holding him back, quote-unquote. We'd seen him do all these things that at the moment were kind of standalone, but still tests of what was important to him. But at the end, you know, it kind of culminated, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the more that you put your characters in situations where they have the opportunity to make these man versus self choices, um and then give them freedom to choose i mean obviously your star wars example there were a lot of times where anakin could have chosen dark or light and sometimes he chose light and sometimes he chose dark um and eventually he went all the way dark until return of the jedi when he's like well maybe light is the way to go um and uh but the more opportunity that you give your characters to have these choices, um, then you're going to, well, obviously in, in Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to give them the opportunity to have these good character, characterful con- conflict moments. Uh, and if you're writing books, um, in books we call it tri-fail mm-hmm. cycles, where... Um, you give them a challenge and in almost all books uh, as you are rising to the climax of the book it is a try-fail cycle where they try something they fail at it uh, but it gets them a little bit closer they try something else they fail at it things look bad uh, but they're a little bit closer they try something they fail at it and it goes and goes and goes until they try something and they succeed and then they win and um, and that's what you want to have happen is give them opportunities to try and fail. Yeah, that it kind of like speaks to an issue with DMing is that DMs are so cautious and I'm right there. 
uh, I'm very cautious to have my players just straight up fail. You know, <laughs> uh, like I want to wow. throw them that bone. I want to be like, oh, you did it. Good job, buddy. Um, but but it, that actually is probably hurting the story, you know? Yeah. Honestly, this speaks to kind of a larger topic of consequences for failures, uh, you know, because if at those kind of junction points where they have those choices, those things that they're trying, uh, there should be consequences for either decision, you know, uh, I, I, I'm having a hard time thinking of one. You know, Sam picking up Frodo, the consequence is that Frodo still lives because if Sam had taken the ring, he probably would have killed Frodo or something like that, right? Um, but they both get to live. I, I think incorporating those into those those micro decisions is also important because if they choose wrong, there should be a lasting consequence, even if it's maybe just emotional damage or something. You know, in the case of Anakin, he killed the Tusken Raiders, he remembered that, right? And also, they didn't show this in the movies, but they should have. He told Padme, and she should have remembered that, you know, he killed women and children, and uh, he's probably not the best guy to marry. Anyways, um, adding those consequences, I think, is, is kind of the next logical step. But that might be another conversation for another day. I think we've hit our time limit. Uh, I just want to say thanks so much for, for being here, Rob and Tanner. Uh, any any yeah, last thank you, Rob. <laughs> any, any last words for our listener, and then we'll give Rob a chance to kind of shout out any, any websites to find him and his uh, war game minis at Tanner, Rob, anything else? Uh, I'll start and I'll, then I'll leave the end to Rob. Uh, I, I think I really like this conversation because it, it goes to show that so much of, you know, we can't control what our players uh, do uh, for their character or how they set their character up. What we can do is kind of play like kind of the angel and devil on their shoulder and present challenges that will help them kind of flesh out who they are so that you can then pay that off later. Uh, anyway, I've really, I've really liked that. I love it. I would just end by saying that every time that I've had the most terrific experiences in a role-playing game, um, it is kind of these surprising and inevitable moments. It is where um, we have all been sitting around someone does something, there's something that happens, and we're like, that is perfect, haha, ha, we all laugh, we're like, that's terrific. Even though it might not be we mm-hmm. won, it's like, that is exactly what needed yeah. to happen. And um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you win, it, does, it, it could be a total failure, but those are the best moments is when uh, it pays off as in... Uh, would this is everything has been leading to this and it yep. paid off. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Totally. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here today. Rob, how can our audience reach out to you, support you and see what you're up to? Um, the wargameexplorer.com is just wargameexplorer.com. Um, uh, also my website is robisonwells.com. You can find all my books there. Um, I'm on Twitter at robisonwells. Um, and I'm on Instagram at Wargame Excellent. Explorer. So. so listener, go Perfect. check it out. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will be back next week for another amazing episode. Uh, listener, come back next week and hear us. But until then, let's go ahead and roll initiative. Thank you for listening to today's show. Uh, we really appreciate your support and your patronage. We have a few more announcements to go over. Uh, first, did you ever fall in love with the library as a kid? It was a place where you could experience a thousand stories without having to buy a thousand books. That is what Monsters.Rent can do for your D&D campaign. You can rent and swap out as many quality miniature monsters and creatures for your D&D party as you could ever want without having to buy them. You can rescue villagers from a kobold camp or lead your party through the fighting forest or many more adventures. We're coming out with new bundles all the time. Just sign up for our subscription to get access to your own personal library of minis. Go to monsters.rent to find out more. That's the website. Monsters, with an S, dot rent. Get your library pass to a world of minis today.
We also wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Stardust and Dragons. I'm going to let one of the cast of Stardust and Dragons, Christian Hatcher, and his crew tell you a little bit more about it. This August, a new adventure podcast is coming to a platform near you, filled with action. You one of the two of them. We can't keep hey. taking hits like that. Drama. Everything that she's been doing, every, she, everything she's going to do, finally sets in. And Stardust. Help! Help! <coughs> Someone, please! Find out more about this epic odyssey at stardustanddragons.com, where adventure awaits in the stars. That's all the announcements we have today. Again, thank you so much for everything you do for us. You make this show possible. Like we said before, we'll be back next week with another great episode. And until then, let's go ahead and roll initiative.